Now I have been falling in love with barbecue over the last few years, smoking pieces of meat that look like this. And when I get obsessed with something, I like to share it with all of you on YouTube. But the truth is I've been struggling a bit to figure out my place in the barbecue world because there's already so many incredible dedicated barbecue YouTube channels. But you know, this is Pro Home Cooks and the goal is to make incredible food that feeds your family, that feeds your friends. And one of the best ways to bring people together and feed the masses is smoking meat. And although this might not be competition style barbecue right here, people still love the barbecue I'm giving them and that's good enough in my book. So today we are going deep into the world of smoking and I'm gonna be breaking down all of the fundamentals from choosing the proper smoker to picking the right cuts of meat for barbecue to getting the perfect barbecue sauce and of course the entire smoking process from beginning to end which currently we're right in the middle so it's time to get back to some smoking action. Now harnessing the power of fire was obviously the first human cooking technology that changed everything. When it comes to smoking, we're harnessing the power of fire, but we're isolating the smoke to cook our meat or cook our food in general. You can cook anything through smoke, but it's just a gentler and a slower process over a low heat. Now there are so many different types of smokers out there. It can be a little confusing, especially as the technology just keeps advancing as more people get into smoking. The most traditional type of smoker you'll see is an offset smoker. They come in a million different forms and sizes. You also see box smokers. You'll see propane smokers, which uses propane to actually maintain the fire. There's charcoal smokers, which are also great. But my favorite smoker, and I know I might get a little hate from the barbecue enthusiasts, but for me, it's the pellet grill because of two main reasons. Number one is this thing is fully automated. So there's a system and software in here completely regulating the fire. So you can maintain the exact temperature you want and you can adjust it however you want it. So it is the true set it and forget it system. And for my lifestyle, I've got a million things going on. I wanna throw a piece of meat on here, set the temperature, know that it's gonna stay at that temperature and just go do some other things, do some other cooking, go for run whatever it is for me at this point in my life i just don't have like 10 hours to sit here and stoke a fire maybe one day not right now now number two is that pellet grills are very efficient they run on pellets which is just compressed wood you can buy of course different wood pellet types for different flavors for your barbecue and really one bag of pellets is at least going to give you a full day of barbecuing so you don't need to go out and chop wood or get a bunch of raw pieces of wood now you certainly will not get the best barbecue product with a pellet grill that's just a fact if you want the best stuff if you want the competition grade get an offset smoker, learn how to build and maintain a proper fire in there. But for me, the effectiveness I'm getting for the effort I'm putting in, you can't beat the automation here and the flavor. It's still incredible. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's fine for this guy right here and all the people eating my barbecue. When it comes to smoking meat, it's really all about choosing those cuts of meat that can handle that low and slow cooking process because we wanna give the meat ample time for that smoke to penetrate and really give it the flavor it deserves and also develop an incredible crusty bark over an extended period of time. So those more tender cuts of meat, like a steak, yes, they will smoke and they'll probably taste delicious, but you're better off using something like that, a barbecue, like a propane barbecue or charcoal barbecue that can really hit it with that high intense heat and develop quick crusty flavor. And also since you're investing a lot of time into this smoking process, well, you want to invest in some high quality meat. So today I'm going with Porter Road, which is an online butcher shop delivering you high quality meat right to your doorstep. And I'm really excited that Porter Road is sponsoring this video because I have been a huge fan of Porter Road for years now. And what's great about Porter Road is they actually started as a butcher shop in Nashville by two butchers, Chris and James. So you still get that local butcher 
butcher shop experience, but they've done an incredible job converting that experience online. So you can still order items a la carte, like you're right in the butcher shop, but they also have the subscription box option if you are into that. And I'm telling you, the meat is so high quality. They work exclusively with local farmers. We're raising animals on pastures with no added hormones or antibiotics, basically raising animals the proper way. So if you're interested in checking out some meat from Porter Road, make sure you click the link below because they're offering you $20 off your first order of $100 or more. So check out porterroad.com slash prohomecooks and that promotion will be automatically applied. So I'm gonna be smoking three different cuts of meat today just to get a nice little variety. I've got your classic brisket. Now I'm also cooking up some dino ribs. These things are awesome. They can be a little difficult to find depending on where you're shopping. And these are actually the short ribs, or in this form, they'd be considered a plate of ribs because you can see here, they haven't been sliced up into the typical smaller short ribs that you would see, say, in the supermarket. And then finally, I have some St. Louis style pork ribs here, which is just a really nice meaty rib that smokes up really well. Now, when it comes to trimming the fat off the meat, it all depends on how the meat was prepared at the butcher. So in this case, Porter Road took care of most of the butchering, but I am gonna be doing just a little bit of touching up. And really the main thing to understand is that the fat is going to add a wonderful flavor when it's rendered out. It's also gonna add a layer of protection from drying out on the smoker, but when you have too much fat, it won't have a chance to render out and you don't wanna be biting into just a huge chunk of fat. So when you're trimming up the cut of meat, you're just trying to find that balance. You don't have to trim off all of the fat that you see, but if there's a huge cap or a huge chunk of fat, you can trim that down a bit. Plus, you can just render that down and use it for uh, cooking fat, which I'm actually gonna do for the barbecue sauce. Now, of course, when it comes to seasoning, there are endless possibilities. I mean, you can really go as crazy as you want. There are thousands of barbecue companies out there making their own special secret seasoning that are pretty much the same five to seven spices, just a different form, a different ratio. But for me, I like to do just salt and pepper because you're getting so much incredible flavor from the smoke. We're smoking these cuts of meat for hours and I want the smoke to really shine. So just a salt and pepper mix of 50% salt, 50% pepper, shake that up, boom. You've got an instant salt and pepper shaker that you can use to season up all of your cuts. And you just wanna focus on getting a nice even seasoning. Let it sprinkle from a height and get that perfect coating so it's not too little or too much seasoning. But another reason I like keeping it simple with the seasoning is because when it comes to barbecue, you need a barbecue sauce. For me, that's where I'm gonna add that additional flavor if you want it. You can taste the meat plain, but then you can also just dip it in a delicious barbecue sauce. And this recipe will blow your mind. Trust me on this one. It kinda leans more towards uh, fast food style barbecue sauce. That really heavy, dark, delicious molasses style barbecue sauce. So you remember that extra fat I trimmed off those beef cuts? Well, there is no reason not to add that flavor to this barbecue sauce. So I sliced up a few chunks of that beef fat and I got that rendering in a pot. Now this will probably take about five to 10 minutes. And in the meantime, I'm gonna slice up some aromatics. I'm just using half an onion and a few cloves of garlic. Now, once that beef fat is liquefied, you can remove any of those little crispy meat pieces and start frying your aromatics on a medium heat. I'm gonna hit it with that salt and pepper shaker right away to speed up the caramelizing process. And now here's the perfect barbecue sauce ratios. I'm going in with one cup of ketchup, a third of a cup of brown sugar, a third of a cup of molasses, a third of a cup of apple cider vinegar, a quarter cup of soy sauce, and a spoon full of miso paste to really enhance the umami flavor of your barbecue sauce. And I'll just let that simmer away for five minutes to really let those flavors develop together. And after five minutes, I'll take my immersion blender and just puree all of those aromatics into that sauce, cook it for a few more minutes, and boom, the perfect beefy barbecue sauce ready to go for your barbecue. 
So we're fully prepped. We've got barbecue sauce ready to go. All of the meat is nice and seasoned. Now, because I was filming today and taking my time with the prep, well, I'm not actually going to smoke the meat just yet because I wanna give it enough time to one smoke, which requires hours and hours and also rest. So what I'm gonna do is put the meat in my fridge overnight and it's gonna dry brine overnight for the say 12 hours it's in there, which is completely optional. You can just throw the meat right on the smoker and get smoking, but I will see you tomorrow morning when I have enough time to really focus on this smoking process. All right, it is officially barbecue day and we're going on this journey together. I'm gonna to take you through every step of the process. And the first thing to mention is timing, which is very important. Say you're having a party or an event later on, you wanna give yourself ample time to not only smoke the meat, but to let the meat rest, which is almost as important as getting a perfect smoke. So something like a brisket, which is definitely our biggest cut of meat, it's gonna take at least an hour a pound. This is a smaller brisket, so I'll need most of the day to smoke it. Obviously something like a pork rib right here, very small, that's only gonna take a few hours. So it's 7 a.m. right now, I'm gonna fire up this smoker. We'll get all of this meat on on the smoker and we'll talk temperatures. Now, since we're using a pellet grill, we don't have to discuss fire maintenance because all of the fire and the smoking is completely automated in this technology right here. But we do need to talk about temperatures. So when you're smoking meat, we're cooking at a low and slow temperature. So think about, you know, braising a piece of meat in the oven. It's the same concept. We want to hit that range between around 225 degrees Fahrenheit and 275 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the perfect low and slow range for cooking meats. And if you hit somewhere in that range, you'll probably get good smoked meats, but every single smoker is different. For instance, when it comes to a pellet grill, this is a small smoker. Think of it like an air fryer of smokers. It's all condensed in there. So you wanna aim for the lower end of that range. Whereas if you have a huge offset grill, you can cook at higher temperatures, like 275 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna set this for 225, and that's where we'll do all of our smoking. And you can also set the smoke amount on this, so I'm just gonna keep it at a five, which is right in the middle. Now, just like regular cooking, you can of course adjust this temperature if needed, but I'm just gonna rock on 225, and we'll come back to this in probably two hours. I'm gonna give it a nice head start without looking at it once, because what does Aaron Franklin say? If you're looking, you're not cooking. All right, so it's been just about two and a half hours at 225, and I have resisted checking, so this is exciting. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So you can see this beautiful mahogany color on all of the meat. Check out these ribs, because they're gonna be cooking the quickest. This rack is really thin back here. You can start to see a slight pullback of the rib bones right there from the meat, but we definitely have some more time. And when I look at this fat, when you push on the fat, it just bounces back. And that shows me that we're very early on. It's not rendered yet. And this is super tough. We're just getting into this cook. Now, this is a good time to talk about spraying your meat. Now, spraying is optional. You don't need to do it, but it will add a little bit of flavor and it will also keep pieces of your meat from drying out. So in this case, if you look closely, you can start seeing some of the edges getting just a little bit dry. And that's when you would wanna spritz the edges, focusing on the actual meat, not the fat, because the fat is already moist. You don't have to worry about protecting that. It's the exposed meat that you wanna keep nice and moist. So what I have right here is just a mixture of equal parts apple cider vinegar and water. Super simple, you can get as crazy as you want with your actual spraying liquid. But again, I like simplicity, keeping those ingredients minimal when it comes to smoking and just relying on that smoke flavor for the good stuff. So just give that corner a spray there. Brisket a spray. Spray those ribs. Now before I close it, I'm just gonna hook in this temperature probe and I'm gonna pop that right into the 
juicy part, and I'll start to monitor that. I'm guessing it's not too high right now. We're, you know, 115. We got to get up to the 200 range. So I will close that, and I'll check back in kind of soon because I need to be careful with these ribs to not overcook them. Another hour has passed by and I want to check in on these pork ribs. As you can see the fat really starting to render here, starting to get softer as well. Might as well spray these while we can. I'm gonna stick a probe right in there. Oh wow, yeah, see these are just about done. You can tell the probe goes in very soft. Look at the fat rendering off of that. So I don't want these completely falling off the bone. I want to bite into that rib and get a tenderness, but also have a little bit of texture there. So I'm really liking where these are at, but what I'm going to do is take them off, coat them in some barbecue sauce, and throw them back on for about another 15 to 20 minutes to just caramelize that barbecue sauce. Let's check on these ribbies. Well, those are looking great. See, that's getting a little dry up there. Moist here, dry here. You can see where the fat is. It's still nice and moist from that rendering fat. Now, if we come down here, those are looking great. That's what I'm talking about. See that fat is just rendered. Oh yeah, those are done. It's sliding in like butter. So I'm gonna take those off. Just let those rest. So you can see the bones popping through there. Barbecue sauce, nice and caramelized. These have been cooling for about 30 minutes and we're gonna talk about resting time later for the bigger cuts. But these pork ribs are so small that they just need a little bit of time. Look at that rib right there, juicy. Falling apart just a little bit, but clearly still holding its form enough. Nice and glazed up. They certainly look incredible. Smoke ring right there, a nice smoke ring. Let's give it a taste. That membrane just fell right off. That's all right, there's not much you can do about that. That is definitely the best pork rib I've ever made. Now, some people might not actually like it that tender. Like this is, I can just pull that right off. Some people like more chew and that's totally fine. Just cook it a little less. That's the beauty about doing your own barbecue. That's just perfectly smoked pork. Wow. Just check in on that brisket temp. Oh yeah, 160. So this is a great time to talk about the stall. So big cuts of meat like this, you're smoking them, you're checking the temperature and it's going up and up and then all of a sudden it's gonna stall around 150 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what's happening is just like human beings, as the meat heats up, it's cooling itself by sweating out liquids. And as the liquids come to the surface and start cooling the meat, now that cooling process is competing with the heating process, all of the heat trying to cook the meat. So at that 150 to 165 range, you have this competition of the cooling process and the heating process. And one of them is trying to win out. Of course, we want the heating to win out. Now you can just let the meat smoke at the same temperature and eventually you'll battle through that stall and the internal temp will start going up quickly after that. Now there's two other ways to deal with the stall. You could increase the temperature to say 300 degrees Fahrenheit and just really hit it with that heat and battle through then lower the temperature again. Or you could take your brisket, your short rib off. You can wrap it up in some tin foil or butcher's paper, put it back on here, which is going to help cook it a little quicker. But right now with the way this is looking, I still want to develop a little bit of bark on this. So I'm just going to turn up the temperature a little bit to 250 degrees Fahrenheit get through that stall and we'll check back in in probably 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. So the general concept of wrapping is pretty simple. We're cooking in this smoky convection heat, which is creating this beautiful bark, all of that flavor, which we want. But over time, it will start to dry out the crust and dry out the interior of your brisket or whatever you're cooking. So the best time to wrap would be when you're happy with the crust, when it's looking great, you've got that nice bark, the flavor is there, and you just wanna finish the cooking through until it's tender because when we wrap the meat, it's protecting it from drying out, but it's going to speed up the internal cooking process. So right now, when I look at the brisket and the short rib, I'm happy with the bark. Now this isn't necessarily the type of bark you would get from a huge barrel smoker like you would see in Texas, but it's still gonna be loaded with flavor and I wanna protect 
protect the juiciness of the brisket and the short rib. What I'm gonna do is take both of these cuts off right now and wrap them in some butcher paper. If you don't have butcher paper, you can use tin foil, but butcher paper is a great investment if you're getting serious with barbecue because it's more porous than tin foil. So you'll still protect it from drying out, but some of that moisture will still be able to escape. Whereas if you wrap this, say, in tin foil, you'll create so much steam and moisture that you can mess up the integrity of that bark. It's almost 4.30, so, so nine hours. Nine hours for the brisket. And I think we're done. This is the brisket over here, short rib over here. Now there's two main ways to tell if your brisket's done. The easiest way, which is great for beginners, is a temperature probe. Now we're looking for a temp somewhere between 195 and 205 Fahrenheit. But remember, the brisket will cook a little longer once you take it off. And there's also multiple parts. There's the flat and the point. So you wanna take it in multiple places. So here in the point, I'm getting 195, but that's the thicker part. Now, if I go down to the flat, I could imagine it's gonna be much higher, 204. As far as the short rib, okay, the short rib's at 195. I could let that go a little longer, but I might as well take them both off. Now, the other way to tell if it's done is by feel. When you put the temperature probe in there, does it feel like butter? Is it going through without a lot of resistance? And here, yes, it feels like butter. All right, the final stage that is so crucial is resting these big hunks of meat. We all know about resting when it comes to cooking up a steak. You want those juices to reabsorb. When we get to bigger pieces of meat like this, it's even more important. There's more potential juices that could be lost. So what I'm gonna do is take out a cooler. A cooler is optional. You could just rest these at room temp for a few hours. But when you have that insulation, it's going to slowly bring that temperature down, which is very beneficial for the final product. Pop these in here. I'll let those rest for about, I don't know, probably three hours. I think there's a storm coming right now, but I wanna be slicing these up at, you know, 7.30 for dinner. All right, these have been resting for a few hours. Uh, the brisket and the short ribs. Oh yeah. Look at these. That's insane, still intact. I mean, that's pretty much just falling right off the bone. Whoa, butter, my God. Can I just show you something? That's insane. We'll do a taste test in a second. Let me cut the brisket. Here's the fat side. Now here's what I'll say about my final products. The pork ribs, probably the best I've ever had. Dino ribs, absolutely insane. So juicy, so flavorful. Now the brisket surprised me a bit. I had a little roll reversal here. Usually when I've cooked dino ribs and brisket together, the brisket takes longer to cook. But now that I'm thinking about it, I believe what happened is because the brisket was closer to the fire, it ended up cooking quicker. So by the time I took it off when the dino ribs were ready and I put them both in the cooler, the brisket was a few degrees over and it definitely dried out a little bit. So yes, a big hit to my ego, but that is the name of the game. That's barbecue for you. There are so many variables like fire placement, the type of meat you're getting, the temperature outside. These are the type of pursuits that I love in the kitchen, or in this case, outside, that I get addicted to, the ones that are so difficult, that take tinkering and learning over time to really get it right, and it seems like you're never fully right. You're always getting better. And for me now, I need redemption. That's all I'm thinking about. So I gotta get out here and barbecue again until I get it right. So hopefully this video aided you in some way on your barbecue journey. Thanks again to Porter Road for sponsoring this video, and I will see you soon.